You've probably already seen this revolting news story. Okay, that's enough of that. Um, what I want to talk about is how football is decadent, or more precisely, it is an avenue, a route, a conduit, a drain pipe for the decadence in us, in our society. We are a decadent society, and that decadence is expressing itself through football, and, and also um, getting turned on us, getting turned against us by things like that, by the, um, the, the decision that uh, um, uh, Blackburn Rovers made. Now, when I, when I say uh, decadent, what I mean by decadent, with the way I would define it, is um, it expresses itself as a, 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 a willingness to uh, um, just do what you want to do because you feel like it and to help with the consequences. And if there's something that you, you should do, not to be able to get up the effort or, or the energy to do it simply because you don't feel like it. Effectively underlying it, there is a, a failure to understand basic cause and effect. The idea that or, um, if I do something, there will be results from it. And I think the, the, the soil, the root of that in our society is the welfare state. I, I can behave as badly as I like and the state will still be obliged to feed, house and clothe and, and even entertain me by buying me a telly. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what I do. And that cuts, that cuts through that, that cause and effect link. And that affects behaviour because people just don't see effects on themselves from their actions. And, you, and that then, um, activity shapes behaviour, behaviour shapes morality, and um, decadence is a moral problem. And decadence is the result. And then it, it becomes a shared habit and you get a, a decadent society. And that is what I think we have at the moment. It might look like football is the problem but the um and football certainly it, it, it is a problem but it is a problem because it is an expression of that deeper problem of decadence within us within our, our society now um, in case you think i'm wanting to pick on football no 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 when i was a boy i was nuts about football i just couldn't play enough of it i remember me and me and my pal andy we would be doubled over with butterflies before the uh, the afternoon uh, the games afternoon because we knew we were going to have a, a football game and i think if you'd asked me then what a homosexual was, I'd have said it's someone who prefers girls to football. I was that nuts about football. I just thought well, that's what everyone does, is what every boy wants to do. And uh, th things changed a little. I had a different experience when I went on to uh, start prosecuting people. And I had a, a really fantastic morning once prosecuting a load of football hooligans in Southampton Magistrates Court. It was great. I enjoyed every second of it. These swaggering thugs were coming into the court expecting to get let off with a 20 quid fine and they were getting fined 400 quid on average one of them got a 600 quid fine because uh, he smirked at the magistrates and they were gasping for breath slumping in chairs bursting into tears all, all those hard lads it was fantastic i would do it for nothing if my principles had let me the only thing that would make it nicer would, would, would have would have made it nicer would have been if the uh, uh, the football thugs could have been led one by one out into the town square along with the town mayor and his poncy garb and a couple of page boys and the nobody councillors lining the route and then strap that hooligan over a barrel and give him a dozen that would have made it nicer unfortunately for the mayor he didn't get the chance to reduce them to tears i did uh, and uh, i i'm very glad i did i thoroughly enjoyed it i would recommend it to anyone else now back to that revolting story if I show you here, here's what Albeeb have to say about it. Blackburn Rovers becomes first UK football club to host Eid prayers. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? Uh, Yasser Sufi, integration manager at the club. Well, fear a club that needs uh, someone with that job title. <laughs> well, you've got to have an integration manager to play football well. We live and breathe one town, one club, one community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An event like this shows this better than anything else. It shows that we are all one. No matter who you are or what your identity is, the football club is somewhere where you belong. Yeah, well, he obviously hasn't, obviously hasn't read chapter 9 of the Quran. Now, this is nothing new. It's been going on for years, decades. Uh, um, the, the, the BBC, the sports section of the BBC webpage looks to me, and has for year, many years, has looked like a, um, 
a, a social justice warriors news sheet. It's uh, it's just like a sport. I don't think is there to uh, inspire or to thrill or even to entertain anymore. Its primary purpose, its social purpose, is to hit us over the head with the, uh, the diversity stick. And it's been done all the time. It's been going on for, a, uh, um, well, for, for at least a decade, I would say. If you look at um, th this story from uh, 2015, there you are. Muslim prayer, that's, that, this is Sky Sports. Muslim prayers are helping to tackle stereotypes about Islam. Yeah, and he's tackling a stereotype by doing that on a football pitch. What a great way to tackle stereotypes. And it is nakedly political. Uh, let's go down to... Well, <laughs> how's this for Sky Sports reporting? Allah helped arrange February's Newcastle Unites demonstration against Pegida. This is back in 2015. Patriotic Europeans against the, the Islamization of the West <laughs> rally. So they're not, trying to, they're not trying to sugarcoat it there, are they? You can read that article for yourself. It's another series of assertions, multicultural diversity assertions, as multi multiculturalism generally is. Um, it, it's um, if, in case you think it doesn't infect the fans, it certainly does. The, the fans don't seem to have the character to resist it. Uh, look at this news story, which had seemed to have the the, the BBC LB gloating. Mohammed Salah inspires uh, RB Muslim too. Let me let me play that. <laughs> Well, it goes on and on and on. Oh, oh, okay, well, that's disgusting. That is disgusting. Let me look at the next one. Yeah, and it affects the players and managers as well. Here's Gareth Southgate. Uh, if you remember during the, the Euros uh, finals, he couldn't resist banging on about diversity and inclusion. So, and he couldn't resist writing this article for the Players' Tribune, Dear England. Again, another series of diversity uh, um, assertions. What's enjoyable about the article, I, I won't read it at any length. What's enjoyable is when he says something that he thinks uh, you might question. He doesn't, he doesn't try to persuade or <laughs> produce evidence. He just says, you might not think this, <laughs> but it's true. So I mean, that's, that's the level of his forensic intelligence and, uh, and his fitness for what he's, the, the diversity case he's trying to make. But um, let, let me go down a bit. I mean, you can see this. He's talking about the players here. It's their duty to continue to interact with the public. What he, what he means is to talk politics, okay? uh, to pontificate about wider social matters. Yeah, it's the, it's the football player's duty on matters such as equality, inclusivity and racial injustice or using the power of their voices to help put debates on the table. I don't believe for a moment he wants um, debates to be had. He just wants a point of view to prevail. That is not debate. And I can't resist talking about the moment when I think it may have hit him in the face when he shows, I think it was three, um, th three black guys to take uh, the penalties at the final. Okay, so uh, you, might, you might have seen this, but it's always, it's, this one's good for a laugh. It's 20 seconds long. Yeah, the effrontery of that. Imagine, imagine a, a white pub um, near where I live. No one would think of saying, give it to a white guy, he'll score. What would it, the police would bust the place up in a minute. I mean, the place would get closed down if, if chance like that were going on. These days. Oh. oh, oh dear, didn't work. Okay. So the next example again is from Sky News, just an article Euro 2020, where is home? That, I think, sums it up. Other countries, other peoples, other nations are allowed a homeland. We, the English, we are not. You are to be stamped on if you even express such a desire. Um, the English people have never existed or we're just a recent invention. No, no. The English nation state is the oldest nation state on earth. We are certainly one of the, I think, the most uh, um, precious and also the, the, um, the, the most effective uh, um, nation on earth. And we prove that time and again. The, the, the idea that we don't have a right to, to our own home is um, 
idiotic. Okay, England squad held as a celebration of diversity and immigration. Now what this article, seven of the three Lions players who started against Denmark have a parent or grandparent from overseas. So that's seven of the 11, all right? And it just goes through, the whole article is going through each player saying, oh, he's not from here, he's from somewhere else. Isn't it great? At least he's not English. Thank God he's not English. Which, what I find funny is the impression I'm under. I don't know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure I can prove this, but there seems to be a correlation between the level of diversity on the English, England team and the, the, the embarrassing way that we flunk out of the World Cup. I could be wrong, there could be no link, whatever. But um, th this article is very keen to go on about it. And uh, there you can see, and it, it even, um, one of the fellows could have played for Ireland, and so they consider that's good for, that's good for multiculturalism. And there's uh, this lady, Lauren Tavriga, executive assistant of Best for Britain. Best for Britain is, it was a, an anti-Brexit organization. Um, um, I've never heard of her otherwise. The squad is a wonderful example of the benefits of immigration. So mass immigration that's occurred over the last 30 years uh, and um, looks set, or, or, well, could become a majority in, in uh, well, certainly, certainly in births in, in the next um, decade, decade and a half. Uh, uh, that is justified on the basis that you might get into the finals and then flunk out in the finals. Isn't that wonderful? Well, I, I'll forever be grateful for that. And is a celebration of <laughs> diversity. So, yeah, I think that's about, that's about all it was, actually, that team. I don't see what, what else it accomplished. Well, it got to the finals, I guess. Cheering on football this summer will not just be about celebrating when the ball hits the back of the net. It will also be to celebrate diversity, immigration, and freedom of movement. So, um, th yeah, that, that is the purpose of sport. It's basically to co-op people, to, to, um, to, to push them in to, to uh, a certain type of opinion, get something they're interested in, and then link it uh, uh, um, indelibly with, with something that you want them to agree with. And um, that, is, that is diversity in this case. And then uh, Gareth, South, uh, Gareth Southgate again, talking about England fans should be proud of an island our size. Okay, he's saying uh, you need to be um, pro-diversity, pro-multiculturalism if you want to be patriotic. That's basically what I think he's saying. Speaking on Friday, he expressed the wider significance of Sunday's historic showdown against Italy, with the three lions uniting the country as it emerges from the pandemic, encouraging diversity and taking a stand against racism. Okay, so okay, he does not sugarcoat things. And the problem is, when you focus so heavily on rhetoric like that, you fail to provide substance. And um, I don't think, I think there was a lot to be quite ashamed of about those finals. For instance, uh, Arsene Wenger, he, he said that uh, England got into the final because one of our players dived. And there's Raheem Sterling. Is that a dive? It looked like a dive to me, but what do I know? And uh, is that really such, is that a, s such a thing to be proud of? Uh, well, I'll let you judge. And the next one here, this Guardian article. Euro 2020, UEFA opens disciplinary proceedings against England as it happened. That's, I think there were three sets of disciplinary proceedings against England coming out of those finals, booing in other people's national anthem, throwing fireworks at opposing players, and then this act of gentlemanly sportsmanship, shining a laser into the eyes of a goalkeeper about to have a penalty taken against him. So I think you could, we could really feel proud of our team's performance with, uh, 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 with, with actions like that happening. Obviously, the person shining that laser, he felt very proud and confident uh, about his team. And that was the match against Denmark, which we won by fair means or foul. And um, a lot of Danish fans had this to say about English fans. And this is the point I want to come to about hooliganism. It was not a pleasant experience for Danish fans. Danish fans hit by insults and saliva at European Championship semi-final. I will never go to an English football match again. That's, the, uh, that's what the Danes thought, of, thought about that. And if I get down a bit here, I have never experienced that they have gone after me as an individual as they did yesterday. And this next one, bottles of urine thrown at Danish fans at Wembley. That's the beautiful game. Now they are complaining to the, the football disciplinary board, I think. Okay. And the, the next one, 
That's uh, another Danish news article. English fans booed during the national anthem, vilified and threatened Danish fans at Wembley. This is an account by, again, another woman being attacked by the gallant English fans. Uh, the Danish men's national team stood with a straight back and the same focused gaze we have seen many times before during the final, this final round, etc. And the English fans booed. I, I won't go through the, the, the whole article, but you can see there. Um, she got a fist in the stomach. And then they spat, the fan spat on a little boy. There's one later where she talks about another lady getting hit on the head when someone scores and she's getting called a whore. And she, well, she looks perfectly nice to me, perfectly pleasant. And, uh, uh, and then when you get uh, down to the end, what she's, she's basically asked, is this just a tiny minority? This is one of the arguments that get, gets used. The excuses that get made uh, uh, for Islamic terrorism have been made for decades about football hooligan hooliganism. It's a tiny minority of unrepresentative extremists who give everyone else a bad name. It's the fault of the police. It's the fault of the stadium. It's the fault of society. That's always, again, everything, all, all the excuses that Muslims come out with. Those, those are tried, tested and practiced excuses. And football hooligans have used them just ad nauseum. Um, what she had to say is, Ordinary Englishmen think it's just a few who ruin it for many, but that was not what we experienced. It was the sweet and friendly English fans who were outnumbered, unfortunately, she says. Now, what I want to do now is to look at the history, uh, or part of the history of football violence, football hooliganism, it, it, to show that whilst um, it, it's pretty ugly and pretty um, very unimpressive, the way it's been responded to, the way it's been excused, and the way people have um, just sucked up to it and said it's okay. But um, it, it, but really, to say that the problem doesn't originate in football, the problem, that decadence, is in us. That problem begins with us, our own society. And it finds a very free, easy, and well-catered-for uh, route of expression, a kind of a drain pipe for the filth in the game of football. If you imagine football as being like the drain pipe, but not the filth, then, then that's, a, that's a fairly accurate metaphor. And what I want to do is to look first at the, um, the Heysel Stadium uh, disaster in, or um, massacre in 1985, and the response to that, then at the Premier League, and uh, the, then uh, uh, what has happened, um, what is happening today, uh, the, the hooliganism at the, the Euro finals. But I'll start with the, the Heysel Stadium disaster. Now, you might not remember or have heard of the Heysel Stadium disaster because no one mentions it, least of all a Liverpool fan. The Heysel Stadium disaster was when uh, Liverpool fans um, killed, I would say massacred, uh, 39 just very ordinary men, women and children, the sort of people who might um, just go for a picnic in the park. They decided to go to, go to the football match and they got crushed by um, Liverpool football fucks who attacked them and they tried to get out of get out of the way and a wall collapsed 39 died as you can see there and uh, 600 were injured and i think quite a few of those football fans those liverpool football fans were very lucky not to have been charged with murder because i think it would have been possible to say that their intention was gbh which resulted in death so i think that they got quite uh, derisory sentences from, from the belgian courts they should have really had the, had the book thrown at them um but uh, um, well, well, and th th that's the Heysel Stadium disaster. It tends to get overshadowed by Hillsborough. A Liverpool, a, uh, if a, if a Liverpudlian is feeling self-pitying, he'll never shut up about Hillsborough, but, and he'll also never, never mention Heysel, which I, I, I think I think was worse, um, because you, you go into someone else's country and you, you're just killing so many people. What I want to look at is two uh, YouTube documentaries about the Heysel Stadium disaster. This one, How Heysel Changed Football, Explosive 1980s. That's, um, it's 47 minutes long. It's, again, it's worth looking at simply because this is a bit of history that's been, that's gone down the memory hole and it shouldn't have. Now, if I play, if I just show, show you the, uh, what happened at Heysel, it's really, it's pretty revolting to see. Those Liverpool fans are just disgusting. <laughs> If 
you see that that, that is um, Italian supporters being crushed against the wall. That wall collapses. And these poor guys are just bloated, down arms out stretched, mouths open, and you know, gasping for air, and then all these hands reaching for them. Sadly, there's pictures everywhere. You know, you just have to try very hard to cover it. People just start to hear screaming and coming, and you thought, my God, this could be serious. And then there's a huge surging, a lot of screaming, and of course, the, the moment of impact was when the wall went. Okay, so you can watch that yourself. It really was an appalling case. What I find interesting about this documentary is all of the good people are commenting on this, all of the, 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 um, the good people in authority. They turned out to be wrong. And all of the unimpressive, the, the lousy people in authority, they turned out to be right. Effectively, you had, you had two um, lines of opinion. The first line of opinion, that was Margaret Thatcher's, line of opinion was football's a disgusting game, it's got some disgusting people in it, you've got to stamp down hard to prevent football hooligans. The, the unimpressive football uh, authorities, they were saying no, it is a social problem and these hooligans are, are, are inflicting themselves on our game, they are infecting our game. Our game is the victim of hooliganism and not the perpetrator of it. And uh, um, you want to side with people like Margaret Thatcher, but you, you, you find, well, I find that the people who have turned out to be right were these um, unimpressive, I think quite dismal, uh, football authorities. Now, Margaret Thatcher's um, line was very hard against football even before the High School Stadium. Uh, as she, well, if you, I'll just show you this clip. By the minute it is Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher identified three violent errors in modern Britain. The IRA striking minus. So, so Margaret Thatcher sees football hooligans as being as bad as the IRA or the miners, and you know what she did to the miners. So, I mean, she was she was um, pretty 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 on message, pretty tough uh, about football hooliganism. And this is the approach she wanted to take. I, I don't think it worked, but you can't say that she was the the tough option has not been tried at the highest levels. So, th this is what she had to say. The Prime Minister invited down the streets seven football journalists who have been enticed. <laughs> okay, so she invites a, a bunch of football journalists, and I think there's one thing that one of these football journalists says a bit further on, if I can get to it. Hold on. Whether or not there is a famous manipulated situation, it's unclear, it's possible, but uh, certainly it's not, it's not a small handful. Okay, so it's not a small handful, it's not a tiny minority. That was recognised in the mid 80s. So um, Margaret Thatcher then summons the FA leaders to uh, her office and ask them what they're going to do. And this is where I think a significant exchange takes place between them, which explains it quite well. And much as I hate to say it, I think she was wrong and these dislikable football authorities were right. But let's play this, this next little clip, just a bit of background. I think she's actually bad. So you see that that her view is that it's a cancer that's spreading out from football into society. The football authorities think that the cancer is coming from society into football, metastasizing into football. Uh, as I say, the filth um, going through the drain pipe that is uh, the game of football. There was a famous incident which has never faded from the memories of those who heard it when Ted Croker, the then Secretary of the was prepared to voice the feelings that the lot of his colleagues had. They never, they never they expressed in her presence that football was the victim of wider trends in society when he said, Prime Minister, 
We want you to take all the good guns out of our game, and we're not going to do them anymore. Two days after the heist tragedy, Thatcher summoned Dallas to Boris Milichin and Ted Kroger, the chairman and secretary of the FA. You see them, you don't want to like them. You, you instinctively find them a bit, I find them a bit repulsive um, in a way that I don't with, with Margaret Thatcher. Um, but I think that exchange, I think he was right when, when he said that uh, society should get its, its hooligans out of football rather than football taking its hooligans out of society. It, the problem is in us. Anyway, so, so these FA... Uh, well, I don't, don't want to say what I think of them. These FA fellas, they go and talk to, to Margaret Thatcher, and uh, it's not a very happy meeting. But the response to events in Brussels did not address. The football authorities were very sorry figure, yeah, that's those two. Now, that fellow talking there, that's Bernard Ingham, that was Margaret Thatcher's press secretary. It won't this was society They abandoned, in effect, all responsibility for this. So, um, that, that is the view of the politicians against the, uh, um, uh, the football authorities. But I actually think that was because the politicians didn't want to root out the decadence in our society. How do you do that? I think the only way is, is going to be getting rid of the welfare state. That forces people to be a bit more responsible to understand cause and effect. And, uh, but you can't get rid of it. If you try and just cut welfare the tiniest bit, you, um, you'll get vote booted out of office before the next election. So the, the situation limps along and there are more restrictions on um, English teams going abroad and um, English teams at home. And it looks really bad for football for a while until eventually what you end up with is uh, the Premier League system where the, the, the top teams with a lot of money, they, they really kit out their stadiums well. They put in seating, a lot of fencing, a lot of funnelling to, to, to um, usher the, 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 the fans this way and that. And then you, you combine that with a, a sort of a, a militaristic uh, police operation, which is something like where the police are something like, like a cross between cinema ushers and uh, uh, soldiers ferrying prisoners of war back to the rear. It's a kind of a, a, a in some ways, a very a molly-coddling militaristic police operation uh, uh, or in, in the way that, that scientists that, or football fans are being handled as scientists would handle dangerous chemicals. It's that um, idiotic. So they form the FA, uh, the, sorry, the Premiership. The top, the top clubs, clubs in the, the FA created a glamorous new league, league the, the Premiership, and not... Again, look at them. You, you can't like them, can you, those men? English football into a new and modern era. era. All right. The, uh, you can watch the rest of the documentary. Uh, ba basically... The, 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 what happens with the, uh, the Premier League is that um, the, the problem of hooliganism doesn't get dealt with. It gets contained in a way that isn't going to offend anyone. That's really what happens. And when you do that, like, like a, a cancer, it's a horrible metaphor, but uh, the cancer will just, it'll grow, it will metastasize. You, you, don't, you can't contain decadence in a society. And so it grows and you eventually get, get to the situation where then what it looked like was um, that violence and decadence coming out of football grounds. People go to a football ground, they have a punch up in the football ground and then afterwards they might have a punch up in the streets as they're going home. But what we're seeing recently uh, with the Euro finals is that uh, the violence is coming from outside trying to get into the stadium. It is taking place within wider society, football-based based violence. And then um, because that, that decadence, that degeneracy has been allowed to continue for so long within football, it's, it's no surprise. 
if you if you're going to behave like that, if you're going to um, develop an avenue of behaviour like that, you should not be surprised if someone else bigger than you sees an opportunity to use that avenue for bad behaviour against you, to turn it on you. And that's what the authorities are doing now with all this multicultural uh, nonsense and uh, madness that, that they're inflicting on us via sport, particularly uh, via football. But so. so that problem, the basic problem of decadence within football, that was not, um, that was simply contained by the Premiership, but it looked like it had gone away. Everyone thought great football's coming back. And that was then jumped on, particularly by the Labour Party, which wanted to appear to be the party of the people. So they would, they would all say how much they loved football. What I want to look at now is uh, uh, the, the other documentary that I, I, I've um, picked out. It's a kind of a discussion program. It's uh, Sue Cook, Football Fans Abroad After Brussels 1985. And um, if you might not be able to hear this one so well, it's, it's bad audio, but you can see the subtitles. And what this, again, seems to, to me to bring out is that the people you want to agree with are not the people who turn out to have been wrong. And in particular, let me look at this, um, well, this Tory MP who's commenting. He seems like quite a nice guy, I just think he's wrong. Yeah, that's what he's... When, when you get football fans saying, oh, it's not us, right, it's the police's fault, the police policed us badly, or um, we were hemmed in by too many railings, it's not our fault. Well, um, the police don't force people into riots at the Queen's Jubilee. You, you'll see that in a few days' time. Yeah, so what he's saying is, um, there's so much trouble, maybe we just get rid of football and that gets rid of this problem. My argument is no, because the problem comes from society, uh, and, which may, makes me sound like some liberal um, uh, social worker, but it's our own habits of decadence in us. And that, then you, you hear this whiny Liverpool fan going on about oh, what a great game he is. I don't know if you can hear this. Okay, he's not the brightest button, but you get what he's saying. <laughs> I, th I think he's right. I don't, I don't like the look of that fella. Um, I'm sure we wouldn't get on very well. But uh, I, th I think what he's, what he's saying is right. That there's quite a funny moment later on in this discussion where Sue Cook looks at all these football fans, these, these, these fellas in their seats and says, has any of you ever, ever uh, participated in... Um, in violence on the terraces <laughs> and you can hear the crickets chirp they're all looking at their shoes looking at the ceiling saying nothing none of them denies it none of them's making any admissions it, it then goes on to talk about or to, to talk to um some of the, the dismal fa figureheads who are getting, who are getting the dislikable but I, but i think right for maybe for the wrong reasons but I, i'll show you that a couple of them now to, let me know in the comments if you can like any of these these fellas. Yeah, what a tragedy high school was. It was a massacre, not a tragedy. Okay. Yeah, so that, what he's saying is it's the scum in our country, not the scum in our, that's infecting our game. No, no this, this next fella, just listen to him woofing away, all right? This, I think this is some Norwich politician who got into managing football somehow, I don't know how. He got a knighthood as well. <laughs> Sir Arthur Smith. Hold on, I'll get that. Yeah. 
it was a little bit of an it was commemorating other heritage. There was a determined effort in our country by a number of evil people to smash society, and that's the will of the week. Okay, so he's, got, he's falling for the tiny minority excuse, but his main point is right that um, football is simply the occasion for this decadent violence. Um, the, pro- the problem is that the authorities have sucked up to football. That they've tried to ingratiate the football fans so much by simply say, saying how wonderful they are and how there's nothing nicer than a football crowd. And, um, and so people see it, that that makes an avenue for bad behaviour. I think I'll leave it to Robert Maxwell to make the point that probably one of the most repellent men ever to have trod the earth, um, pompous windbag, nasty guy, uh, moral example to, the, to, to, to children, perhaps his, his, his daughter, Ghislaine Maxwell, well, he's going to give a lecture about um, young people's morality. Okay, just <laughs> try and hold your gorge while you listen to this. Oop. We so that's Robert Maxwell. What a fine example to the younger generation he turned out to be. What a repulsive bully as well. <laughs> and yet you can't deny he he he, he is right. Um, in, in, broad, in broad terms. The problem is in society, it is a problem of decadence, it is a problem of people not seeing uh, a cause and effect. If I do this, it will have this result. That is the root of decadence. And then people just say, well, I'll do what I want because I feel like it and I don't care about the consequences. I don't care what happens. Now, this, this lady here, That is Margaret Beckett. She was a Labour politician at the time, quite senior. I'll talk about her in a minute um, uh, because she's quite good fun. She comes out with a great big whopper of a lie, which is a lie lie that um, that, that, uh, took root within the Labour Party because it was was politically convenient. There you are, tiny minority. No, no, it isn't. There you are. Look, look at the expression on her face. Okay, she knows. She knows that's a load of lies. It's just making excuses. The Labour Party cottoned on very fast and in a very opportunistic way. Let's suck up to football fans. There are lots of them. A lot of them vote for us. Let's not say anything bad about football. Let's say, okay, they may be killing and massacring people, but sometimes killing and massacring people is useful, i.e. in war. So it's not so bad after all. That was the kind of non- that's the kind of line that appears to be getting peddled there. It's, not a, it, it's, it's certainly not impressive. It doesn't impress me. Maybe I've completely misrepresented it. That's the way it reads to me. Now, just to, to skewer that argument, because I have heard it from other um, ordinarily quite sensible people. Well, OK, football fans may not be very nice, but at least they make good soldiers. No, that, that's total nonsense. What I want to refer to is a book by this fella. His name is James Dunning. And he um, was, I think, one of the founders of the Commandos in, uh, I think it was early 1940, about um, March or April 1940. And uh, he wrote a book about the training, uh, the selection and training under the commandos. I want to read you a little bit of that, so let me just bring that up now. Now look at that uh, that book, James Dunning, It Had to Be Tough. That was about the training that the commandos underwent because they were, it seems um, difficult to believe, but they were um, asked what their training should be like. And they all said, well, it's got to be tough. And so that was the title of the book where he talks about the training that the commandos had to had to undergo, and let me just let me just show you a picture of him again. Hold on. He was a delight. Doesn't he look like he was a delightful old fella? I, I I met him once very briefly, and he was a lovely guy. It was pretty much impossible to believe that he was the uh, the, the the ferocious killer that he had been, training a lot of other ferocious killers as well. 
Now, what he's describing here is the, um, the, the selection method, that different commanders had different attitudes towards selection. So one of them said that he liked uh, musicians and army bandsmen because, because they have to do three things at once, aligning foresight, backsight and target at the same time, uh, at any range and with any weapon. And he went for studious artistic types because they were super sensitive, which he reckoned was essential for his own specialised commando subunit, the special boat section. And then what he says is, whatever their priorities, so whatever the command, the um, commanders of the commandos priorities were, uh, whatever the priority, their priorities all agreed, there was one undesirable type none wanted, the swaggering tough type whose toughness was mostly displayed in pubs under the influence of alcohol. I think that describes a football hooligan, swaggering, pissed up, and um, a, 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 from my, in my experience, a total coward otherwise. So respect to that old fella, James Dunning, founder of the, or one of the founders of the Commandos, and uh, Yabu to you, uh, um, Margaret Beckett, we can see through you. But that was a successful line for uh, the Labour Party. And you can see that in this article from uh, 1999, so 23 years old, that article, Football's Labour of Love. This is where this fella, Simon Buckby, who was, who was there, there, uh, in charge of their election advertising campaign, he, he um, explained why it is now cool for politicians to express a passion for the nation's favourite sport. And he goes on about how Tony Benn and Mandelson uh, were, uh, claim to be absolutely passionately in love with their, their local constituency parties. And uh, um, it is, I think it is significant that under Blair's government, every MP, when they did their listing in Who's Who, listed one of their main hobbies as being supporting the football team of the constituency they lived in. It's basically the way to show you're a regular guy, you're in touch with people, you are the same as them, so vote for me. That's what's going on there. It is sucking up. So I, I think what you see, what I see um, happening there, is you get a, a, um, a picture of uh, a society that's getting steadily more and more decadent as the size of the state, the welfare state, uh, grows and the influence of the welfare state grows. The influence on people's decisions, uh, decision making, the disconnect between what they do and the results that people experience. Cut it, cutting that, that uh, action and results link. And that creates decadent habits and that, that grows and metastasizes like a cancer. Those, those football authorities talking about a cancer, it is like a cancer, that decadence, the, the way it metastasizes. Um, unlike cancer, it, 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 isn't, it isn't permanent. It, it, it comes and goes, a bit, bit like the flu. Maybe that's a, a better metaphor. But so, so you see how that happens. And then you, you get a system where uh, the authorities think they've managed simply to contain it through the Premier League system and the policing, the semi-militaristic policing around it. And then politicians go and suck up to it and say, isn't it wonderful? We will not say anything against football. And people pick that up, people with bad habits, people who just want to go and carry out a bit of violence, they will see, or just to behave in a, a thoroughly degenerate way that should not be allowed in public, they are, um, they are able to get on with it. What this shows is the value and the benefit of repression. I like a bit of repression. I think it's sometimes good for you. I think it is sometimes really good for society. That is why I'm an anarchist. But I, again, I'll go on about that at, at another time. But repression is sometimes a good thing. But no MP was going to talk any repressive talk in respect to football. And so that's how it becomes all carved out all the more as a route, an avenue, a, a conduit for decadent social habits to, to move and to express themselves. If you doubt that, I'd like to uh, recommend uh, that you read this book. It's about 20 years old. It's called The Welfare State We're In. James Bartholomew making points similar to the points I'm making that um, the, the, the welfare state, it seems nice, it feels nice. You think it's going to do a lot of nice, compassionate things, but actually it does a lot of harm. The, uh, the road to hell or the road to dystopia being paved with good intentions. It's a really superb book. It's timeless. It, it sets out the case better than any, anything else I've read. And um, I, I want to read 
Well, that, that, that's the cover there, an honorary part of it, where he talks about football matches uh, less than a century ago. On this page here, he's looking at a, what a, <coughs> a, a, a social psychologist, a fellow called um, George Gora, uh, said about English society, where he said, um, if you bear with me just a moment, Sorry, that's Geoffrey Gora. He's looking at the gentle in the 1950s. He's looking at how, how gentle and self-disciplined English society is, and he's almost baffled by it. So if I, if I deal with this, as a psychologist, he was puzzled uh, in his book exploring the English character. He took it for granted that aggression was part of human nature. What he found intriguing about the English was that their natural aggression was so successfully controlled. Y yeah, yeah. And look at the Euro finals to see if uh, the natural aggression is successfully controlled amongst the English. And so what, what the psychologist said is, in public life today, the English are certainly among the most peaceful, gentle, courteous and orderly populations that the civilised world has ever seen. You hardly ever see a fight in a bar, a not uncommon spectacle in most of the rest of Europe or the USA. Football crowds are as orderly as church meetings. This orderliness and gentleness, this absence, absence of overt aggression, calls for an explanation. So I think he tries to come up with an explanation, but I think he's, in a way, he's still kind of, kind of baffled by it. I mean, he, it, just to prove the point, there is a picture from 1935, the crowd at a Bristol Rovers versus Bristol City match in 1935 football crowds are as orderly as church meetings okay now uh, in case you don't know bristol rovers versus bristol city that's a grudge match that's a local derby that's where the hooligans um really want to sharpen their boots and get out and have a have a fight and look at that look at they don't need all around overhead fencing there you just got a little picket fence they're all in suits and ties there's well, it, yeah it is quite like a church meeting so it's difficult to say, you can't say that football is inherently violent, inherently decadent. It is at the moment because it's expressing wider habits within society. There's, what I'm reminded of is, is there's um, an expression, I, I think, within the, the drug treatment profession that is the, um, hold on, let me just get rid of this. Uh, there that is the addiction tree the idea that let's say someone's addicted to snorting heroin well you might you might be able to stop them snorting heroin but they'll soon find something else to get addicted to porn or crystal meth or alcohol or gambling and that, that's the idea and the idea of the addiction tree is you go deeper and deeper and deeper you don't just snip off one branch you try and get down to the trunk and even the roots in the soil in order to deal with the roots of the, the problem. That's the idea. I'm not sure I, I buy that bunch of excuses, but I certainly think you can talk about the decadence tree. If your society, if society is decadent and that decadence is allowed to, to blossom and grow, you'll, it'll eventually become like a tree that will support any number of birds shitting all over you. And if you chop off one of the just one branch the birds will hop onto another branch and they'll carry on shitting all over you there are loads of branches of decadence in our society modern art modern music i think the trans madness attitudes to consumption certainly very much attitudes to monetary policy and borrowing and debt that's extraordinarily decadent um consumption in general so, so the, uh, uh, um uh, and i think that is true of football so those those dismal football fans and dismal football authorities i think i don't like to say they were right but i think they were the problem is in us not in uh, their, their game and what i think we're starting to see now is um that, that uh, uh, our own bad habits our own decadence really trying to invade football rather than coming out of football into our society and uh, I, I, that was, I think that was really on display at the Euro uh, finals uh, at Wembley. I want to show you a, a BBC clip, which isn't bad, it's pretty good for the BBC. Uh, I'll bring it up now. Now it's this fella, Roz Atkins, uh, and this is from about a year ago, I think, this, this video he did for the BBC. How did drunk yob yobs break into Wembley for England's uh, uh, Euro 2020 final, BBC News? It, it, it's not bad, I'll, but I want to go to the relevant parts, okay? And this clip from the video shows uh, a BBC fellow who went there, uh, went to the match, uh, just as a ticket holder. 
and you see what he says. Well, at 5 p.m., David Nicholas, who works for BBC, who was attending the game as a fan, arrived. This is his account. The first thing I saw as I exited the station was there were about 50 men urinating against the wall. Wembley Way itself was virtually impassable. Uh, the crowd was just too large, and the, the floor had become a, a sea of broken glass, cans, rubbish. And some of the fans didn't seem to be listening to the police advice. Some were arriving without tickets, some did have tickets, and they continued to arrive. At 5 pm, three hours till kickoff, and here are fans still pouring. Look at how pleased with themselves those supporters are. They know they can behave like that and get away with it. No one will do anything. If anything, they'll be applauded for patriotism. This is phony patriotism. This is decadence. Bring out of Wembley Park Station and heading to the game. By this point, Wembley Way looked like this. Thousands and thousands of fans, far more than the number of police or the number of security guards. That's normal for a big game, but it's a factor in understanding what was to follow. So what you have is a load of people turning up without tickets and they just barge their way in. So here they are trying to barge into the stadium. But by 6 p.m. the situation was deteriorated. A barrier by the steps of breach, hundreds more through. It was filmed by England fan Gavin Marshall, who gave us this account. Yeah, we met with a few Wembley security staff and uh, very few police, two, three. They had to be quite a lot of force. Uh, uh, to try and control that crowd and stop them from coming through, but a number of people did break through. Here's another one, a film by England fan Sandy Sohoni. He was on the stadium's second floor looking down. You see stewards and police trying to hold back crowds, there are scuffles, some fans are falling over each other, some do make it through. And all this has been... Okay. Huge crowds at the main entrance, he reported, and others now trying to get over the step railings to bypass ticket checks. What had started with the worsening situation on Wembley Way had then turned into fans pushing through COVID barricades, and now, for some, a run towards the stadium. This footage was taken by ITV journalist Michelle Owen. She shows fans running up the steps towards the stadium. You can see them here, and the stewards are clearly outnumbered. The safety risk was clear to those caught up in it. And so, so that, as you can see, that is not football inflicting itself on society. That's society, us, inflicting itself on football. And it wasn't just at Wembley. Um, if I show you this, uh, this next one, this is uh, Leicester Square around the same time. I did, this only runs for a minute. I'll show you some of this. That's one of the main squares, a public square of the capital city, and that's going on. You see them all there um, th throwing, throwing the bottles on the ground, smashing the glass. That, that's, the, that's the pastime of the day. And there are plenty of bottles to smash as well. Okay, wind on a little further. There you see, that's a window, a shop with its windows smashed by the football rioters. That is not hooliganism, that is a riot. If any society that allows that kind of behaviour in public, that is decadent. You, you don't, a healthy society does not allow that kind of behaviour in public. If you want to behave like that, rent some kind of gentleman's club and smash the place up and pay the bills if you, if you can afford it. But you don't do that. You don't, um, we, well, a, a main public square in the capital city that people want to go and enjoy and, and you, you turn it into that kind, that kind of riot zone. It, uh, a, a society that tolerates that doesn't really uh, deserve to survive very long. And don't think that will end there. That is muscle flexing. 
Hooligans are opportunistic. They know how far they can push it. I can, I, I can guarantee you, those fellas, they know how far they can go before they will get cracked down on. So they know a bit of property damage, smashing glass, they'll get away with. If it gets more serious than that, they better not risk it yet. What will they do if authority breaks down? That is, um, it is, it does, that kind of muscle flexing will not end there. At some stage, I do favour um, cracking heads and firing semi-lethal or lethal ammunition at football rioters like that. I would, I would favour that. I think it would be a very good bargain. It would be uh, cheap at the price, uh, a very uh, um, cheap in terms of bloodletting. Uh, if you look at Heysel, that was 39 people died. I think the numbers who died at um, Hillsborough was 97. If you didn't have this, this, this problem, if you could control this problem by um, killing a dozen people um, by firing buckshot and bayonet at them, it would be a price worth paying in, in terms of lives. Uh, and you don't have to kill that many people to put a stop to a problem for quite a long time, for half a century. And uh, that, would have worked, that would have worked wonders. I'm not advocating that, but I'm saying at some stage, I do favour uh, um, uh, perhaps kind of semi-lethal uh, um, plastic bullets, that kind of thing that um, put your eye out or, or shatter your pelvis, ju just so you could to, to really make an example of, of uh, rioting crowds like that. I wouldn't advocate that at the moment. I think it would be pointless because I think you'd be simply, um, uh, it would be like rearranging the deck chairs. You'd be pushing uh, the decadence, the decadent behaviour that has been allowed to, to, or has been encouraged and nurtured by, by economic policy, social policy, and by political rhetoric for so long, that that decadent behaviour would simply shift I into into some other, some other atmosphere or some other um, environment. The, the what's necessary is for the the uh, decadent habits that we have developed to. Um, to go. And I have good news for you. I think that will happen because I think the welfare state will collapse. That is my good news. You are looking at the collapse of the welfare state. And uh, as a result of that, I think that will be the end of the um, self-defeating personality disorder that tends to accompany societies that are heavily dependent upon welfare as our society is. I think it is unavoidable that the welfare state will break down. So that will end these problems. At that stage, then I think it will be appropriate to go in hard to say, right, these habits have ended. It is no longer viable for you to behave like this. We're going to get you. We will suppress you hard and we'll put a stop to this once and for all. I certainly would do that. I would favour aggressive repression uh, when, when the time comes. I don't think the time is right now because, as I say, it is not a question of football. It is a question of our society being decadent. I say it again. In the, in the meantime, um, well, I think we probably just have to wait for the uh, the breakdown to come. Everyone thinks that's a bad thing. I think it will. I think it will be very very bad at the time, very unpleasant at the time. I think the long term effects will be good. In the meantime, if you are a football fan and you find things like this happening, that okay, if you see that happening to you. Um, or at your ground with, with other grounds are going to host Eid prayers next year or the year after. Don't think that's restricted to Blackburn Rovers. And if you're a football fan, and, and uh, don't be surprised and don't complain when you find your sport and your ground getting turned to uses like that. This you you have allowed your sport to be used as as um, uh, as a as a for decadent pastimes. You shouldn't be surprised that people bigger and stronger and more influential than you then think, great, we can use that method against those people for our own benefit as well. That is what I think is happening there but with um, these revolting news stories that I began with. So, um, well, I think it's just a question of living with it at the moment, possibly trying to contain it, but then when things change, then you go in hard and you put a stop to it for good when society changes. I think that will happen towards the end of this decade. Okay, thank you very much.